40 miles back and forth to work every day. You can be all battery. If you have to take a weekend trip and you need to go three, 400 miles, don't worry, you can use the same product. Still get great fuel efficiency, but you don't have to worry about stopping every 40 miles and, and recharging your battery. General Motors as a company has accepted uh, what about emission standards? What about the environment? What about climate change? Well, basically our view is um, on um, the issue of emissions and climate change that uh, I think a fairly broad consensus in society that we need to continue to reduce emissions. So, um, you know, that's something that's kind of driving fuel economy improvements in these alternative forms of fuel that we've discussed. And it's certainly clear that the, the climate is changing. Frankly, still, I think, some debate around how we can fix that. But it's clear to me, as I sit here running General Motors, that we need to be part of the solution. So we're trying to develop alternative fuels. We've invested in some, for example, um, of the, uh, the cellulosic ethanol uh, uh, right, manufacturers. Right, right. We're working on battery technology. We're really working on the full range there. And we've also gotten uh, become a member of US CAP, the cap and trade group, right. which is trying to, business leaders and environmental groups, trying to debate, and it's fun to listen to our debate sometime, how we could uh, begin to work systematically in a way to reduce CO2 emissions, but in a way that doesn't do uh, significant damage to the economy, but rather encourages innovation in the direction that, that, that we all want to go. Is it, when you look back, since you have been a, a principal executive of this company, a mistake by most automobile companies in America uh, not to, to be press harder for emission standards and B, not to press harder for fuel efficient cars. No, I don't think it's been a mistake at all, Charlie. What's been a mistake is that the way we've gone about it in the U.S. is counter to just about every other place in the world. And um, what we learn in this economy is we can produce whatever we want to produce or if the government tells us to, we can produce that. But if the consumers don't buy it, we don't have a business and, it, and it's not going to work. And so um, you go to a place like Europe, I always talk to representatives, or representatives in Washington, they go, well, I was just in Europe and they have a lot of small cars there. Well, sure they do, and we make a lot of those and sell them. But the reason is because people there are paying five, six, seven, eight, nine dollars a gallon per gas. And so they are reacting as very rational consumers. And you know, yet here, I mean, I, uh, it's as if, okay, you produce the cars that get great fuel economy, but, um, what if the consumers aren't okay. interested in buying them? And, and let's talk about what's happened in the last three months. So people are buying still a lot of trucks, a lot of SUVs. Gas prices go up to $4 and becomes the buzz every day. And guess what? People all of a sudden are buying and valuing more fuel efficient cars. So our job is to offer those in every category. But I haven't yet been very successful in forcing a consumer to buy something that they weren't motivated to buy. But what you just said, the bottom line is if in fact gas prices had been at four and five dollars a gallon in America, we would have had a much more demand for fuel efficient cars okay. and emission standards. We see this in every country in the world that we So work. is that a good argument for gas prices to be four or five dollars? And, and I would say this is, this is what I call a big hat public policy issue, but my point is um, I think it's quite inconsistent to, to say, hey, consumers, uh, you should have freedom of choice to buy, which we like. Um, we're we're going to keep oil prices low or not tax oil or whatever. And um, automakers, you produce vehicles that are highly efficient even if people don't want to buy them. I mean, let's face it, we, we build the products that people wish to buy. And, um, and a year ago they wanted to buy trucks, and now they don't. I mean, they wanted to buy trucks in unbelievable proportions, yeah. actually, over the last 10 years. And I those remember, things were also the most, most profitable for you, too. Sure, sure. And you, you know why they're the most profitable? Because they were in the highest demand. Right. And you know why? See, if you look in Europe, if you look at our profitability for our very smallest cars versus our largest cars, the gap isn't so great. Here in the U.S., the gap has been very great. And the reason is because, basically, people who were buying smaller vehicles we're generally doing it not because of you know fuel prices, et cetera. It's because this is all they could afford. And so it resulted in the skewing of profitability into the categories that people really wanted, which were generally you know kind of luxury cars and, and, and larger vehicles. Um, and this certainly isn't a comfortable position that we're in or the economy's in, but as oil prices have gone up, it's going to balance out 
you know, the profitability across our product, product portfolio. So that's why we've decided, hey, we're going to go hard into car, trucks or cars and crossovers. <laughs> and uh, if that means sacrificing some truck profitability, we, we do that. Um, but I think consumers are, are, are the most effective force to lead us, lead us where, where we need to go. Okay, but I mean, are you, you have to plan ahead four, five, six, seven, ten years, yeah. uh, knowing that the economy might be different than you expect, oil prices. Is that, what is the oil price that you pretty much make your assumptions on? We're, is it $135, $140 a gallon? We're uh, expecting that oil prices will continue high. We look at scenarios where it goes up rapidly to $200 a barrel. We look at some scenarios where it goes down, I would say generally not below $100 a barrel. Um, I think that's a good planning basis, but if we'd have been having this conversation a year ago, I suspect our topside number would not have been. Well, I saw so. somewhere you said you'd be short on oil prices at some interview you did with FT, I think. Yes, yes, that's right. I, I, don't, I don't call all those things correctly. <laughs> but, but my point is, uh, the other thing we need to do is um, make sure we do a continued work on manufacturing flexibility. And, um, you know, we've been moving to this model of developing our products, um, what we call global architectures, so we can use them around the world. And frankly, given that the rest of the world historically is more highly valued fuel economy, um, that helps us in a situation here in the U.S. where we need to shift smaller engines. Uh, but thanks okay, to let me understand that. In okay. other words, so you're looking for a global platform in which right. the architecture for you to build your cars will be similar around the world. Right. Can you therefore bring that, whatever you've been doing around the world, into the American market? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in fact, that's been our plan for about the last four or five years. Um, and so right now, as we speak, the first product really completely developed under this new uh, global architectural team system was introduced at the London Motor Show, um, um, a mid-sized car that will be sold in Opel, Opel Insignia. But that will uh, serve as the base for next generation mid-sized cars, including one that will be launched here in the U.S. next year. And what I'm saying is we may have initially conceived that product that's going to be in the U.S. to rely heavily on six-cylinder engines, but now with the change in preference for fuel economy, we can put a lot more fours in that product, which, by the way, we developed fours um, as the priority for Europe because that's four cylinders, so that's what you have used there. So we can easily shift and respond to what is now, you know, a different preference here by U.S. consumers. Bob Lutz, <laughs> you brought him back to General Motors. Why? Um, well, it was at a time when we needed to bring somebody new to run our product development. You weren't happy with your product line. Um,